Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this set of podcasts, we look at the impact of the war on society and family life. We hear now from Dr David Munger about propaganda and the role of the press. My name's David Munger. I'm from the University of Canterbury in Christchurch, New Zealand. I'm a specialist on propaganda in the First World War. We understand propaganda these days as a very manipulative, deceitful medium. That's very much a legacy, I would argue, of a post-First World War era and post-Second World War era as well. Propaganda in the First World War and beforehand was a term that had a more neutral meaning simply as another way of talking about information, perhaps a little bit of persuasion. Its long-term roots go back to the 17th century and the Vatican Committee, the Congregatio de Propaganda Fide, which is the congregation to propagate the faith, and is about planting seeds, as propagation suggests, planting the seed of faith. And that idea of planting seeds is still a little bit of what's going on in the First World War. So throughout the pre-war period and into the war itself, people delivering live propaganda wouldn't be shy about saying, I'm here to present propaganda on behalf of a particular organisation. They didn't see it as something that had to be covered up. On the outbreak of the war in August 1914, the government doesn't have a very substantial propaganda apparatus. There are means of publicity, of course, for governments and for individual parties, but they don't have a very well-established system of communication, even the press. And so the first thing that's done almost is to try to control the press via censorship. This tends to be tied to the restriction of military information much more than political information. And so throughout the war, you see the press continues to comment on political controversies, things like the Shell scandal in 1915 that ends up bringing down Asquith's liberal-only government. The Shell scandal is a dispute that arises in the press in the middle of 1915, in the aftermath of the Battle of Aubert's Ridge, in which the commander-in-chief at the time, Sir John French, blames the British lack of progress on the inadequate supply of shells. The problem is that the shells were not provided in enough quantity and many of them were duds as war production geared up and places that hadn't produced munitions before the war learned lessons slowly. Sir John French gets into conversation with the Times' military correspondent who reports, and this causes controversy in Britain, ends up forcing the Asquith government into a coalition with the Conservatives and Labour. The press is very large in wartime Britain. You have the Metropolitan Dailies, things like the Times, the Telegraph and the Daily Chronicle. You have the beginnings of the tabloid press, things like the Daily Mail. But also you have a very large provincial press. So a city like Leicester, for instance, has multiple newspapers, a couple of dailies and several weeklies. So the press is brought under some control. On the other hand, they need to establish propaganda for various functions, the first of which is recruitment of volunteers, Britain, the only major power, the volunteer military force. So they have to rapidly expand they choose not to try and start with conscription, which had been a controversial topic before the war and had been fought hard against. So they stick with voluntarism and push this line that Britons should be willing to volunteer to serve their country, first of all, as soldiers. So you have the Parliamentary Recruiting Committee set up by all parties to convince people to volunteer for the armed forces. The Parliamentary Recruiting Committee is interesting insofar as it depends quite heavily on local agency and local actions. So although it's a central body, a lot of the work is done in local towns and cities where representatives often of the political parties or other local notables set up meetings, distribute information, put up posters on the PRC's behalf and have organised speakers, often from the parties or MPs themselves, to convince people to join up. And that's the start of an ad hoc organisation of propaganda that continues throughout the war. There's never at any point a well-oiled machine, as we might imagine, running propaganda. The best efforts come later in about 1917, 1918, when first the Department of Information and then the Ministry of Information are set up. But even then, they don't actually control all aspects of propaganda. What you have instead is a whole series of either newly created organisations or sections within existing government departments speaking to various different groups. 
So the Ministry of Munitions, which is set up, has a propaganda element. The Ministry of Food, the Ministry of National Service, all conduct their own propaganda as part of their action. You have the National War Savings Committee established to, set, to encourage the public to donate towards the war effort, invest in war bonds and war loans. You have, in 1917, the National War Aims Committee, which is there specifically to remobilise public opinion and keep up public morale at home. Before all those, you also have Wellington House, which is set up by a Liberal MP, Charles Masterman, recruits a lot of the most well-known writers and others of the day, and is geared towards persuading neutrals and the British dominions of the British Empire to take an interest in the war. So there's a whole heap of organisations often competing for the same audience. You could have three or four different organisations trying to hold meetings at the same time in the same town. And so there are occasionally meetings organised to discuss how they can stay out of each other's way. There's a very large number of eminent people involved with propaganda at different times. So Wellington House features a lot of the most well-known writers, people like G.K. Chesterton, so John Buchan, the famous novelist known for 39 Steps, Green Mantle and various other spy novels, becomes the head of the Department of Information in 1917. The Department of Information is set up after David Lloyd George takes charge as Prime Minister and sets about trying to establish a better organised propaganda system. Doesn't get it completely right, but tries to get it more streamlined. Buchan himself is, in the end, not the best person for the job. He turns out not to be a very effective organiser. Hence, after a year, the department is superseded by the Ministry of Information, led by Lord Beaverbrook, the Canadian press magnate, who does a little bit better, but is also not terribly popular around the place. There are battles for authority, for instance, between the Ministry of Information under Beaverbrook and the National War Aims Committee, which is run by the whips of the major parties. In the end, after a long dispute, the National War Aims Committee remains independent of the Ministry of Information and continues to be the only official source of domestic propaganda, although in fact lots of different places undertake propaganda. So Beaverbrook takes charge of the Ministry of Information in 1918. At the same time, you have Lord Northcliffe also brought in to direct enemy propaganda. The organisation becomes known as Crew House because that's where it meets. There are suggestions that Northcliffe doesn't have that much to do with what's done. Actually, it's led by other people and he is the figurehead more than the brains behind the operation. The reason that these people come in is that Lloyd George wishes to keep them occupied to some extent. There's correspondence between him and his subordinate, Frederick Guest, about wanting Beaverbrook anchored. The same is true of Northcliffe. They keep finding him work. They send him off to the United States on a speaking tour at one point and then they give him enemy propaganda to keep him occupied. In reality, enemy propaganda is done more by people like the journalist Henry Wickham Steed, H.G. Wells plays a role at one point, and others. There are efforts to try to persuade different enemies, but mainly the Germans, to give up the fight. One thing that the crew house tries to do is organise to drop leaflets over the German trenches, giving them information about how badly the war's going for them. They're not terribly good at understanding the enemy mentality. The head of London Zoo, Peter Chalmers Mitchell, who compiles this massive report on Germany's propaganda, tries to analyse it all and write up their ideas, but he dismisses various things that would have had potential. So one of the things that he dismisses is German peace efforts. You have a peace resolution passed in the lower house at Reichstag in 1917, you have a minority group of socialists in Germany who argue for efforts to make peace, but he dismisses them as not reliable because they want to undermine the fabric of modern society. In his words, they're effectively communists or proto-communists, while the majority socialists he sees as tools of the state. So because of this report, there's no real attempt to cultivate peaceful Germans or people wishing for peace within Germany. Instead, it's very much, we must carry on till the end. You can't make terms with Germany because Germany is an uncivilised and barbaric enemy that needs to be beaten before it will change. It's hard to say whether there would have been a real opportunity had they pursued it, but certainly there were people within Germany advocating peace. They were often put in their place quite quickly by the increasing authority of the military over the German state. While we get fixated often in talking about propaganda with big names like Northcliffe or Beaverbrook or Bakken or others, 
the reality is that a lot of the propaganda is done by ordinary people who you'd probably never have heard of, whether it's a local councillor, whether it's a parliamentary agent in a particular constituency, a local clergyman sometimes. So local organisers do a lot of that work. And even at the central level, you have lesser known people often having a big influence. Two people I think play an important role in one campaign are two women called Dorothy Peel and Maud Pember Reeves. Maud Pember Reeves is a New Zealander who is known before the war for having done social investigation. She writes a book called Round About a Pound a Week talking about poverty in South London. Dorothy Peel writes a book after the war talking about the experiences. And both of these women work for a campaign between the Ministry of Food and the Ministry of National Service promoting the voluntary reduction of food consumption. The idea being that if you can ship in less grain, that means that the merchant fleet needs to devote fewer ships to that, that can then be devoted to other tasks and therefore lighten the burden all round. What's interesting about Reeves and Peel is that the wider message has a little bit of a nagging tendency that everyone should do their part because soldiers and sailors are doing theirs. But because Reeves in particular engaged in social investigation before the war, she's very keen to make the point that it's not actually working people who are the problem because they don't have enough money to waste money on excess food. Actually, the people who need to restrain themselves are the wealthier who are able to lay in extra supplies, buy things up at high prices, thus pricing poor people out of the market. So while they make this call for everyone to eat less bread, they talk particularly about the need for the wealthy to voluntarily restrict themselves. At the same time, they suggest that if you want working people to eat less bread, you've got to give them helpful advice on what they can get that is cheap, that will be equally nutritious. Peel and Reeves talk about setting up demonstration kitchens. As well as that, they suggest targeting children. They call for essay competitions in schools. Children are supposed to write an essay about the need for thrift in food, send it into the Ministry of Food where Reeves and Peel will mark them, send back their marked essays with an official stamp to encourage children to take an interest. If you involve the children in propaganda, you also involve their parents. The idea is if you write this essay, you're going to go home and talk to your parents about it. They'll then be informed of the need for thrift too. Another example is a play that the National War Savings Committee promote called Patriotic Pence, which is a school play about a fairy called Thrift the Fairy who <laughs> comes into a family's house and convinces them to spend less money on luxuries and treats and use that to buy a war loan instead. The whole idea is that children will perform it at school. They'll get the value out of performing and thinking about the message that it conveys. Also, you are trapping the parents or anyone else who comes to watch it who then have to sit there because you can't really get up and walk out on your child's school play. <laughs> there are other examples as well. So the Boy Scouts and Girl Guides are brought in to do various things. At one point, the Boy Scouts in, I think it's Plymouth, are distributing propaganda leaflets for the National War Aims Committee. They're being sent round door to door as a voluntary contribution from a patriotic-minded children's organisation. And this is symptomatic of the wider aim, which is to promote voluntary participation by the public in pretty much all walks of life. Not everyone can be a soldier or a sailor, but everyone can make a contribution to the war effort according to propagandists of multiple organisations. The key message that comes through again and again is that whatever you do will help the war effort if it's a matter of cutting down on food, maybe working longer hours, investing in war loans, whatever you can do will be a benefit. They target women in various ways. Often they have separate propaganda campaigns directed towards women on the grounds that rather patriotizing, they won't take on the same messages that men will. These things are promoting women's new work in war industries and elsewhere, but also promoting women's role in the home as a contribution to the war effort. So things like spring cleaning, jam making and other things become patriotic contributions to the war effort. Making jam is the way of not wasting fruit. War loans are an area of quite considerable interest for propagandists. Towards the end of the war, you see an increasing number of campaigns that are based around major events. So something like Tank Week, there's Businessman's Week, and then there's War Weapons Week. These things are important because they set up an event in a local society. War Weapons Week, for instance, you have to raise a certain amount of money per capita for the population. And if you do that, then your town or village will be able to name a war weapon, whether it's a tank or a plane or an artillery piece. 
that makes it a competition and a reason to take part. You can choose a week at any point during the summer of 1918, pretty much, but you have to start on a particular moment and end on a particular moment, and whatever you've raised in that period is the amount that is counted. Within that, they set up all sorts of things. They get the local clergy to talk about it in their sermons in the days before the campaign's supposed to start. They arrange special meetings for women to talk about their need to get involved, particularly now they're being so-called rewarded for their war work through enfranchisement. They're now citizens, and therefore they have to make a contribution. They have things like a results indicator, effectively a ladder with numbers written up the back of it, and you reveal a number at different times each week. And that creates an event for people to gather in a town square or wherever and see where the number is. The government wants to try and cover as much of wartime expense as possible without borrowing. It's already borrowing a vast amount from the United States and lending a vast amount to its allies. So in order to try and keep the economy as stable as possible, they want as much investment as possible in war loans and war bonds from the public rather than either raising taxes dramatically or going into substantial national debt. And there is a substantial contribution from the public. So War Weapons Week raises somewhere over £40 million in the summer of 1918. One of the most well-known aspects of First World War propaganda is atrocity propaganda, sensationalised stories of brutality, usually by the Germans against Belgian or French civilians, sometimes in other cases too. And we know now that a fair amount of these events did actually happen. John Horn, Alan Kramer have shown that well over 6,000 people were killed unlawfully by the German army during the invasion of Belgium and northern France. However, they're used quite heavily and exaggerated in some cases in First World War propaganda. And that has come to stand for all of propaganda. The key message, in my view, of propaganda throughout the war is voluntary participation, doing your duty for your nation in whatever way you can. In order to contextualise that, atrocity propaganda is used to give a lively example of what could happen if you don't do your duty. So this is the negative motivation, and that goes alongside much more positive motivations, which include acknowledging what's been done already, as well as making promises for the future. So the promises that are made, two of the key ones, are that there won't be any more wars after the war, because this is the war to end all wars in H.G. Wells' terms. And once they've dealt with Prussian militarism and eradicated this atrocious enemy, they won't be able to fight again. And the way to prevent this particularly is the League of Nations, which they propagandists embraced very firmly in 1917 and 1918 as the great idea of Woodrow Wilson. In fact, it's actually an idea of a critical organisation in Britain, the Union of Democratic Control. The Union of Democratic Control is a dissenting organisation that involves people like Ramsay MacDonald, the future Prime Minister of Britain, the human rights campaigner Edie Morell, a couple of junior ministers from before the war, Arthur Ponsonby and Charles Trevelyan, and the economist Norman Angel. Basically, it criticises the secret diplomacy that led to Britain's involvement in the war. And so one of the things that it promotes during the middle of the war is something like what becomes the idea of the League of Nations, which is supposed to resolve diplomatic disputes publicly through meetings of representatives of all of the nations. So there's not this possibility for underhand deals that then end up causing a nation to go to war. The League of Nations is one of these promises. This is going to be the vehicle for guaranteeing peace around the world forevermore, theoretically. And if you have peace, then you don't need to invest heavily in defence, you don't need to invest in arms. You can put that money instead to things like an improvement of society. So alongside this broad goal of a League of Nations, the other set of promises that propagandists are making towards the end of the war is that Britain will be a much better society for people to live in. There's the famous line of the homes fit for heroes, although actually Lloyd George never says that. He says fit land for heroes to live in. A promise that slums will be eradicated, that education will be improved, that workers' lives generally will be easier and more pleasant. And this is couched as a reward for the patriotic service during the war. The problem, of course, is that neither of these promises, neither the League of Nations nor the material improvements in ordinary people's lives, eventuate in the 1920s. The League of Nations is rapidly proved to be powerless, particularly because of the United States' refusal to ratify it, and therefore the withdrawal of the most important power in the world. While the Depression in the early 1920s puts pay to a lot of the plans for social reform, the government decides to put the money that it has into paying off war loans and war debts, 
rather than into investing in housing and other things. So the promises for a world without war and for an improved society are not fulfilled in the 1920s. And this goes some way towards propaganda's reputation becoming so much worse as the world slides towards war again in the 1930s. That was Dr David Munger on propaganda and the role of the press. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorne and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews, with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next podcast, we hear from Professor Martin Keedle about pacifism during the First World War.